Mahler's Fifth Symphony is a big symphony in every respect. Big orchestra lasts well over an hour, five movements, and it's also big in the emotional demands it makes of us too. Um, there's something about Mo Mahler's music, almost immediately when you listen to it, you know that, that the feelings are strong. You're not just meant to sit and enjoy them passively, you're, you're meant to get involved. But there's a whole question as well when you listen to a piece of music that's well over an hour long, that doesn't have voices, a story, a title, a program to help you or anything at all, which is what actually is going on here? Mahler clearly felt that his symphonies told stories. But what kind of stories and how much should you help the audience? At first, he thought the audience needed a lot of help. So he gave his first symphony a title, Titan, and wrote a very long program to explain what he felt happened in its four movements. And he did almost the same with the second symphony, which is known as the Resurrection Symphony. And perhaps you need an explanation there even more because here's a symphony that begins with a colossal funeral march and ends with a hymn to the immortality of the soul, resurrection. So some sort of story is being told there, isn't there, about death to life. And as I said, Mahler wrote a big program note to explain it. The trouble is, even when you write really detailed program notes, people would get the wrong idea. Alma Mahler, that's Mahler's wife, remembered how when Mahler conducted his Resurrection Symphony in Petersburg, an old lady came up to him at the end of the concert and said, well, you obviously know an awful lot about what's going to happen to us after we die, so perhaps you could tell me what I'm going to expect. And apparently she wasn't best pleased when Mahler said, well, I don't really know. It's all speculative. So gradually he dropped the idea of titles and he dropped the idea of programmes. But the Fifth Symphony is the first one that doesn't have a title, doesn't have a text sung by anybody, a soloist or a chorus, and only leaves musical clues as to what it's about. Again, like the Resurrection Symphony, it begins with a funeral march. Marla loves his funeral marches, and the one at the beginning of the Fifth Symphony is a particularly spectacular example, terrifying and desolate all at the same time. And it's also pretty clear after we've heard this funeral march that some sort of struggle begins, as though Mahler is trying to find some kind of solution to or answer to this terrible vision of death that he's put forward in the first movement. What happens? Well, that's when the arguments start, interestingly, because the symphony doesn't follow a kind of straightforward course at all. After the second movement, which seems to aspire towards the light, in, represented by a magnificent hymn tune played on the brass, that collapses again. And suddenly there's a complete change into a kind of wild manic waltz for the, set, for the third movement. We get to the end of that, the music seems to have danced itself into some sort of resolution. And then comes the beautiful Adagietto, the movement from this symphony that's best known for strings and harp. Mahler apparently conceived this as a kind of song without words, a love song without words for Alma, who he'd actually met while he was writing the symphony. And then in the finale, this song without words, other ideas from earlier in the symphony, including that big hymn tune from the second movement, are all brought together. And at the end, there's an unmistakably positive sounding conclusion with the chorale sounding out again, chiming bells suggested in the surging strings, and finally a great shout of joy from the full orchestra. So death to life with love in the middle. And when you know that Mahler met Alma, while he was writing the symphony and that actually he began the symphony after he had himself a bit of a near-death experience as a result of a rather nasty um, hemorrhage which had resulted in his having an operation. It all seems to make sense, doesn't it? And yet, you know, music isn't like words. It doesn't tell stories literally. We are, in a sense, left to reach our own conclusion about what's going on. And you can see this in the way that people react to this symphony. Some people find the end of the symphony incredibly convincing, thrillingly positive. It's a hymn, it's revealed, if not to God, then to love, to the power of love that's transformed Mahler's life and really given him a new sense of purpose and brought him the love of his life, his wife, Alma. Other people don't find it quite so convincing. They say, hmm, but is that triumph at the end entirely convincing? Have those memories of the dark shadows of the other symphony from earlier in the symphony been banished? Well, in a sense, that's not a criticism of the work. 
you could say that Mars is just being a little bit more modern. After all, how often in our lives do we experience unalloyed, uncomplicated triumph? Things are rarely that straightforward. So this is a vision of life, love, transformation, hope, but it's complex. And one of the joys about this symphony is you can go back and experience it again and again, and each time hear something different, hear a different kind of angle. At the same time, I mean, it's, well, like all great symphonies, it's full of terrific tunes, tunes that you want to come out humming. And the interesting thing is the way that Mahler uses those tunes, because like Beethoven before him, his great hero Beethoven, Mahler realized that something that sounds really dry and academic, like development of themes, can actually be something that makes musical stories really vivid. That the way that the ideas are changed are rather like the adventures of a character in a novel or a play or a film. You know, we expect a character in a film or a play or a novel to be changed by the experiences that they have. And that, in a sense, is what happens to Mahler's themes. I'll give you one example. At the beginning of that second movement, which comes after the funeral march with its terrifying vision of death, an idea is screamed out by the high woodwind, which sounds really desperate. But when it reaches the climax, it's transformed into something which sounds more positive You see what I mean? There's a kind of hope in that. At the beginning of the next movement, that manic waltz I referred to, at first it sounds as if he's suddenly throwing all sorts of new ideas at us. But in fact, the opening idea that it's that same striving idea we've heard in the previous movement that was originally so as desperate and eventually so hopeful. And at the very end of the symphony, it's that hopeful version of the theme which comes back. In other words, even something which seems dry, as I said, and abstract, like the development of themes, is part of the way this music tells its extraordinary story. Sometimes it's so vivid, it's almost like watching a film. There's something almost like a cinema score about Mahler's music. It does make you wonder if he'd lived and, like other Jewish-Austrian composers of his generation, had gone to America, whether he might have made a terrific career in Hollywood. You never know, but it's one of those we'll never know is because, of course, Mahler died in 1911 at the age of just 51. Well, it's amazing what he did manage to achieve, even in that relatively short life. And the Fifth Symphony has long been one of his most popular achievements. It's a fascinating piece. It's one you can come back to again and again and always discover something new in. So much seems to happen. And yet at the end of it, you feel as if you've been taken on a journey by a master storyteller. And that's, I think, one of the things that music can do most powerfully, can tell stories that reach us, get us absolutely in our guts, as it were, speak to us directly, physical, almost on an animal level. And that's, I think, I think, one of the things that makes this symphony so thrilling. It's also terrifically excitingly scored. If Mahler ever wrote a concerto for orchestra, it would probably sound a lot like this symphony. Every air section of his large orchestra gets its turn in the spotlight. Everyone's expected to work really hard and it needs a terrific conductor, not only to keep up the energy, but to keep everyone focused on the task. And I don't think we could do much better than Vasily Petrenko tonight for bringing all of that out. So how do you introduce a work like Mahler's Fifth Symphony? Well, sometimes it's just performed on its own as a concert of its own right. But in this concert, there's something really exciting and unusual being tried. The young composer Grace Evangeline Mason has composed a suite of choral pieces, choral settings, based on Mahler's letters, on poem versions of Mahler's letters. Mahler's letters are fascinating. He wrote lots and lots of letters. He didn't write books. He didn't write articles. He never published stuff in public about his own work. But his letters to his wife, to his close friends, to other musicians, these are the, these are the, the, the documents in which he reveals what's really going on in his music, not just and particular pieces, but what his whole philosophy of music is, why nature and love are important to him, 
what he means when he writes about God, for instance. Is he an orthodox believer or what? And Grace Evangeline Mason has taken several of these and adapted them into a beautiful kind of choral introduction to Marla. So it's a fascinating uh, piece of music in its own right, beautifully written for the chorus. At the same time, it's setting us up for what we're going to hear in Marla's Fifth Symphony. So hearing it first should give you some lovely, as it were, background ideas to what it is that Marla is trying to do in this remarkable symphony. <laughs> 